Welcome to NAS Stars, the NAS Star podcast, bringing you the conversations you want to hear from the front line of tech news. Hello and welcome to the next episode of the NAS Stars podcast. Uh, we have two topics for you again today. Uh, one is around the use of tech in relation to voting and general elections and what the impacts may or may not be around that. Uh, and the second is uh, the future of video, video managed services uh, and the impacts that that's going to have. Uh, and discussing this, I think we can call it discussing, can't we? Um, is Simon Gardner, who is senior consultant uh, and Rick Evely, who is one of our managing consultants. Welcome both. Hello. Hello. I suggest we dive straight in with the first topic. The use of technology in uh, voting and uh, general elections. And uh, a couple of things came out of the recent uh, Conservative uh, leadership votes. So the first thing was uh, the the online voting for the Conservative leadership. And there were pieces of information, whether they're true or not, is kind of irrelevant, but it's sparking the conversation uh, around uh, there was a statement needed that you didn't need to prove your ID to be able to vote online, which I think is going to be an, an opener for a start. <laughs> um, and then that sort of spread into my mind about, well, OK, is technology ready for general elections and that kind of thing? Because apparently a general election is all prepared and ready to go within a five week period. It's just we mm. choose not to take five weeks. We take months. 24 hours a day, seven days a week to plaster us with all this lovely information. So is it suitable? Uh, could we use it? How might it work? And also, what are the social impacts? Because the thought of um, my uh, mother voting in something online, possibly not ideal. Um, so what do we think? Where, where are we? I think it could be done. Yeah. I don't think so, you'd have no ID because um, where we live, when the electoral roll stuff comes up, I get a letter from the council and it's got two ID levels. And if you, unless you intercept that letter, you can't get in. I think there's a third bit of ID that I have to provide that even if someone intercepted the letter, they wouldn't be able to get it. So then that's just for saying who I am on the electoral roll. Yeah. Um, so there might be some other stuff there. So and that's, that, that, that's like where they send you a code and you you put that code into a website and that mm. ties up with you and uh, and so on. So you'd have to have the letter. So, it's like two factor, isn't it? The letter is a yeah. second factor. Yeah. So, I mean, the, there is one place in the world right, where they do do online voting, including in their elections. Right? That's Estonia. That works because they have a bunch of stuff in place to make that happen. Right. They have mandatory ID cards. Those ID cards are smart cards, so you can plug them into your computer. Um, and they have a government run public key infrastructure. That, <laughs> sorry that sorry to interrupt you, the yeah. whole mandatory ID cards. I'm sniffing yeah. a problem in the UK with that element. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's, it, it, it's, an, it's an interesting case, right? They've been doing this since, the, since 2005 or so. But they made the decision to heavily tie this ID card and the smart card that, that's inside it behind all, pretty much all of their government and public services, right? That ties into healthcare, your prescriptions, you do your banking through it. You can do things like sign contracts using your smart card that's provided by the government. Um, so that gives, that gives an awful lot of, um, of the authentication piece that you need for, for online voting to work. What's interesting, though, is still that accounts for less than half of the votes in their elections. So despite despite all of the, the protections and so on, and they've been very used to this for over a decade, more than half of Estonian citizens choose to go to a polling station and cast their votes there rather than doing it online. And do we, I, I guess we don't know, <laughs> but is that is that a generational thing or? Because there's an interesting comparison for me, right, in yeah. the sense of um, the security around postal voting. Mm. <laughs> well, it's not that 
secure either, really, I don't think. You just have to intercept the letter and you've yeah. got someone's vote. But in-person voting isn't secure either because they send you your um, your yeah. card and you don't have to take it. When you no, go into I the mean, polling station, point, they actually. say, who are you? And yeah, I, I mean, just say, I'm that person. And yeah. they don't, there's no ID. And there has been a thing, wasn't there, recently where they were saying, uh, I think the Tories are trying to, were trying to bring in yeah. ID because of fraud, but other people who are opposed to it are saying, well, there's no evidence of voter fraud anyway in this country. It's, it's a very good yeah. point, actually, because I, I, I go to the, the local voting um, station and normally I have to wake them up when I go in. It's, it's that kind of, <laughs> I think we have, we have an appallingly low turnout in this area. <laughs> but you do just go in, here's my name, I live in yeah. such and such lane. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's, both. Actually, that's both, really crap. <laughs> yeah, I mean both, both, both like in person and postal voting, they they have that vulnerability of you know they they could be tampered with, but the idea of doing that in a scale at a scale large enough to properly Affect influence it, the yeah. outcome mm. of an election is uh, is quite difficult. Like yes, you could get in your car and drive around to loads and loads of polling stations. And look so, people up off the electoral register yeah, yeah. and go yeah. early in the morning and go, yes, I'm Mr. Jones of 123 High Street um, and go and cast a vote. But you're limited in how many times you can actually manage to do that in a day and yeah. not be found out. Well, um, then Mr. Jones turns up later. In the yeah, day, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah and, and, but also the know, other thing on that one is you'd have to know that you're not voting the same way that Mr. Jones would have voted. <laughs> otherwise, you're not affecting the result. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it going yeah. this sort of direction. <laughs> no, oh, okay. So, so the so, summary from the Estonia <laughs> example is the yeah. technology is all there. Yeah. But the invasion of civil liberties that would be required to put that in place in this country is never going to happen. Yeah. Well, my my approach on that, and this is just my take on it, is if I haven't got anything to hide, fill your boots. Oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not that exciting. Um, I'm sure other people will challenge that, but. I th- from a technology perspective, I mean, right there, are, there are the big players out there, all right, the, the the big vendors that we all know about, the Googles, the Microsofts, the um, uh, Amazons, etc. You know, so platform scalability to run something like this is there, right? Yeah. We we know that. Um, the technology from being able to prove it's you, I guess, is is also there. You've got. Yeah, you've got accounts to create and maybe multi-factor yeah. authentication to prove that it is you, etc. So you could probably get round that. Um, I guess the question is, and this probably comes back to the, the Estonia piece you're saying about half their votes are still mm. actually cast in person. So I, I guess you'd have to run that process long enough for it to then become yeah. almost peculiar to go yeah. and do a paper vote or you and then you just take or do you just take a decision to go right stuff it we've done this for five years in parallel <laughs> now it's paper voting's if, gone if you're going to do it electronically you have still got to have a polling station because you've got to address yeah. the digital divide you're then saying yeah. people who can't afford to have a device or don't know how to use one can't vote True. so then yeah. you've got to have a polling station for everyone to go and vote it's just they'll go and vote electronically yeah rather than it's very very similar to the cashless argument isn't yes. it you're then forcing yeah. homeless people to have bank accounts when they yes. potentially haven't got <laughs> yeah so you never i don't think you'll ever get rid of a polling a polling station it's just the polling station would become digital and expensive so when in our local village uh, where we used to live we went to vote and the polling station was a caravan parked in the pub car park Car park. I don't think that would happen because it would have to be yeah. connected to the to the internet and have loads of infrastructure to vote digitally yeah 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 and I, and i guess that there are also places which are not that well connected yeah uh, from a digital perspective you think about some of the sort of like the uh you know outlying islands or or, mm. or, or remote sort of hamlets etc yeah. oh my house until a couple of years ago yeah <laughs> where does that leave us technically possible, yeah. technically possible. <laughs> i mean there's, there's 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 the other part of this as well right there's there's electronic voting right as in the as in you go to a place and you cast your ballot on a digital machine, which is very commonplace, particularly in the mm. US, but but dozens of other countries too, um, not without its issues. Mm. Um, I think I think particularly in the States, it was quite an appealing thing because I think a lot of their elections, they're often they're often balloting on a whole bunch of different things at once, right? You go to 
you go to the polling station and you're voting on not just presidential elections but like local representation then there are like mini referendums on various laws so if you're handed bits of paper that would be a lot of different bits of paper to to go and count and, and deal with um, but they do it all at the state level so you have every state doing it in a slightly different way with a different vendor and um, which does limit some of the the risk and uh, and issues around that. <laughs> I don't know how they get around this. I think, they've, but they've got to start. I think. I think the government has got to start looking at it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think with that Estonia example, it's it's a case of they they decided to do digital government as a preliminary thing, and voting was simply a part of that. Um, and you think in, in this country, like most people have an NHS ID. Mm -hmm. that ties them to the to health services most people have a government gateway account for things like tax and and so on uh, you probably have an account with your local council you're probably on the electoral register National there are all these number. places where you where you have identity digitally already it's a question of like is there a good case for tying a bunch of that stuff together into one into one sort of unifying um account i i, I, see, I feel that there is a, a, a sitcom along the lines of yes minister <laughs> yes prime minister brewing for the modern world on that, on that <laughs> trying to get different departments to agree on um yes. investing information together to make it more useful in in general um big data yeah yeah heard that topic <laughs> before that the in-person voting and the paper voting is probably a higher risk yeah. of fraud but i think coming back to your point simon if you don't get it right the yeah. risk of the fraud happening on a mass scale yeah is higher with the tech isn't it get yeah. some bots to actually work it out and go Whoa, there you go <laughs> All of a sudden if, you you've got... if you don't get it exactly right then it could be majorly exploited yeah. yes but you've kind of got to take that step first step and you start at least start trying to work out what it would look like and what you would need to do I don't actually, yeah. do we know if they're do we know if the government are actually even looking at it? As you say, like all the infrastructure is there for conducting ballots and polling stations and so on, and has been for for many many decades. Um, it's something that is pretty cheap, pretty reliable, um, and that generally works. And uh, as we said before, like there's there's little to no evidence of of um, voter fraud so on in the in the electoral system in this in this country even with such lax controls on who can go and vote and, and yeah so and and actually if you if you boil it down to its sort of technical components you're absolutely right it's um it's one let one piece of authentication yep you know id id management filling in a form that gets stuck into a database that gets reported on so actually it's not yep. from technical yeah. angle it's not difficult yeah i mean in terms of actually sort of counting votes like yes it requires a lot of manpower but they've usually been able to find that um, yeah <laughs> yeah and it's a, a fairly unskilled um thing right people just need to look at look at a piece of paper put it in a pile for whichever candidate and mm. um people then go through and count them up um, and what does it and what does it cost the uh what, what does it cost the government on that because they're they're, yeah. they're free uh you know trusted yeah. people and it costs them tea and biscuits and coffee i think and that's about it yeah. isn't it so yeah and i mean the, the, because because we have so many polling stations that are so local um it's not like we have these massive queues to vote like you see in the states and mm. elsewhere mm. um which makes the counting part manageable yeah um, which means we can generally report on elections within sort of 12 hours or so of polls closing that's interesting it took a few turns that I wasn't expecting, but um, I suggest we have a little chat about video next, don't you? Right. So the second topic was the future of video. Um, and I think there's several different angles to it. So we have a video managed service, which we talked about before. Um, the nature of the uh, office environment has changed as people are not going into the offices quite so much now, but they are going back. Um, so that's what happens to the video equipment in there. But um, 
there's a couple of angles that sort of prompted this being one of the topics in the sense that um, telephony is, I think, within the working world for sure, being replaced a lot with video. You just have to look at what we're doing now, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're not having a telephone call to talk about this. Um, so where does that sort of leave it? And then also, uh, I guess, still within the corporate world is where if you're if you're going to replace telephony potentially with video where is video going where do you take it up to you know because you bring your own device you've got corporate devices you've got all that sort of stuff so I'm, I'm intrigued to sort of explore what you think around that sort of stuff i'm going to throw one in where are we on the back end video vendors working together because at the moment we're on a teams call you can have a video call with pretty much anybody who's got an internet connected device with a camera, yep. but you've got to decide between you what platform you're going to do it on. So are you going to have a Teams call or a Zoom call or whatever other calls there are? But when you have a telephone call, you pick up whatever device you have that has a phone number on it and you ring the number yep. of whoever in the world and it just gets there and you don't have to worry about how it does it. So yeah. will do you think that's going to happen that the vendors will all have to interrupt? It's, it's oh god, you go, you go, mate, you go. It's interesting that even even in the video space, there used to be something called standards based video, right? Mm. And <laughs> a, a, a oh, then they used a, to argue about whether the developers well, were being yeah, standards I mean, it, enough, it was, didn't it they? Was, yeah. it, was, it was it was anything but in in reality. But the the idea was that if as long as your room systems talked talked much the same language you could make a SIP call directly from one to another or onto somebody else's um, somebody else's meeting platform and they would talk to each other. And it was like it was like the video equivalent of a, of a telephone number. Um, we seem to get to, um, you know, as unified comms started to become a thing um, and online meetings, we seem to end up with this divergence and all of these separate islands of technology. Mm with all kinds of um all kinds of traps for interoperability and then all sorts of um all sorts of extra services you could buy to be the glue that would sit in between these and allow all these different things to talk together um, yeah because because if you think about it this is something that um email has managed mm. to achieve yeah for years right and same with telephony you know you don't you don't yeah. think well I can only uh, send an email to someone if they're using Exchange. You know, that that would yeah. be nuts. Um, but I think all the way through, you know, you, you look at the um, uh, Link and Jabber piece that used to be around days ago. You, you, there was there was yeah, a, an interop it. gateway, wasn't there? So in theory, no, because of your because of the domain name being exactly. Unique. So in theory, yeah. that address is unique. Yes. Um, so how more how how difficult is it then to say actually yes we'll put in a verification around that to make sure that yes that is rubber stamped and we know it's you etc so you can't be spoofed etc um but what needs to happen next to to then bring those two companies together that's my, that's my sip, is not, it, sip is, is not necessarily vendors? standardly stip is it is it the vendors that need to do it or is it the international standards bodies that need to impose it because the vendors you could say the, the vendors don't want to because they're all in competition with each other. So they actually want what they want to do is they want to wipe out the competition. Maybe not, they should just grow up and work together. Well, this <laughs> is where you have where should be a standard. Should the standards bodies impose yeah. grow up and work together? Yeah, I mean this 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 doesn't seem to be um, this doesn't seem to be getting approached from a let's have an open standard. Um, approach it's a mm. it's a these are the main players in the market and we want our stuff to work across those so we we've seen cisco recently saying they're going to support teams on their room systems and we have the teams room systems um having modes where they can join i think zoom and is it webex meetings yeah um but that's just about hey there's this vendor that's too big to ignore we need to we need to support it in order to um, in order to not lose out 
on uh, on selling people devices. Yeah, you're sort of accommodating it rather than it being. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we. It sounds like basically we need a set of agreed global standards for that to take it to that next level. Hmm. From a corporate angle. Where yeah. do we think video is going to go? Because in in my mind, and I've said it a few times, slightly tongue in cheek, um, but uh, telephony for me is is, is dying. I mm. never make or receive phone calls. You know, even on your mobile phone now, you send text messages. Not a an actual yeah. GSM. It's on the, you know, it's on the wireless uh, or, or or over the data network most of the time. Um, so I think <clears throat> in the same way that facts, which apparently they are now about to make a decision that is going to um so that uh telcos no longer have to offer fax uh capability so that's going finally um yeah. but uh you know in in that same way i think telephony is getting replaced with video certainly within the corporate world um so what do we need to do potentially within the video managed service area to accommodate that because one of the things that keeps coming up with conversations with customers is uh, we want to look at video managed service and they look at their meeting rooms. Yeah. But if we were having this conversation and Rick, who lives in a voting caravan in the middle <laughs> of nowhere with no connectivity, um, uh, if you join with that poor video and audio experience, essentially, and not picking on you, but essentially you're ruining it for me and Simon. So if we were in a room somewhere mm. else, doesn't matter how great your video kit is yeah <laughs> that meeting's now yeah. you know it's a, a it's, it's a poor experience for everyone um it is, it, it's worth sort of thinking about like what 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 the video managed services is there to do and I, I think a lot of a lot of what they're what they're there for both like what what we've provided to customers but where customers have their own teams of AV people around this. A lot of that is around things like just checking equipment is working properly, right? It's people are prone to unplugging things in rooms and breaking um, breaking room kit, so making sure that, that works. But part of it as well, like if there's an important meeting, doing that pre-testing, um, liaising maybe with people from another organization to make sure that their kit can join a meeting, that it's all gonna work that on the day it will actually it will actually happen um, and often um, often I find in, in organizations that have a bunch of meeting rooms and with high-end video kit there's usually a team that actually run those rooms right they're responsible for doing the booking dealing with any food and drink requirements greeting any external guests that come in that sort of concierge type service um, and yeah, it's that's that's very much from this this old world of um, you'll have a video meeting where it's people in one room with a with a video system meeting people in another room with a video system, and that that kind of um, that that kind of experience. As yeah. you say, though, it's it's far more common now for participants to be to be entirely remote. Maybe maybe you have one, maybe you have several, and and yes, they they need a good experience in order yeah. to to present themselves best to the people in the uh, in the room. Yeah. The problem they, is the problem oh. is traditionally the the sort of responsibility for that remote worker stuff has fallen on the IT side, and often those IT and AV teams do not um, yes. do not do <laughs> not work uh, particularly closely with each other. Very diplomatic to, uh, well to, to, to make that happen. Superbly put. <laughs> <laughs> so we need them to grow up and work together. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's the common theme of this. Um, yeah, and, and I think the other thing that's cropped up more recently, and I, I, I'm really sorry, Microsoft. I'm not entirely convinced by this. You know, there's, there's MTR Pro, which has come mm. out for the for the Teams meeting rooms, and it's it's applying AI to. Uh, to the devices in the room so yeah. if the clocks get out of sync if um you know it can sense yeah. that there's something wrong with the application or whatever it'll restart it'll do some things i think that that's all good and it's a it's a great way to to sort of move things forward but coming back to your point simon mm. most of the times that i've gone into rooms and had trouble is because someone has unplugged 
Yeah. And best rule in the world, the AI is not there at the level yet where it can dish out a little bot to go and plug the cable back no. in. No, no. Um, so so <laughs> MTR Pro does give you the monitoring to say, hey, something's been unplugged from this room system. Exactly. Yeah. And it can it can raise an alert and that can go off to you know whatever local team to to fix it. But yeah, you need people on the ground with knowledge of those systems I mean, they need, they need to actually go and thing on the screen. <laughs> When you walk into the room, if yeah. like you said, Pete, when you walk in the room, you've had a problem and it, someone's unplugged something, it needs a little thing on the screen with a little help ticks. guide. Going, well, the yeah, ticks, it or, must be, just if a... it's got things, if there's four things that have to be plugged in or connected for it to work, mm. it just needs that thing always to be there in the top left with four green things. Yeah. And if any of them are out, then it says red. And then when you walk in the room, you know, you need, oh, there's a physical problem I need to have a look at. Yeah, because you could actually even take it, I guess, to the level of you label your cables A, B, C, D, E. And yeah. it's like cable A is unplugged, plug yeah. A into yeah, green into light, slot A. Red light on the front next to A, you go around the back and look at the yeah. socket yeah. labelled A and the cable labelled A and you see what's going on. The other yeah. thing on, that video, on a video managed service, um, I've heard of, and not, I've not seen them, I've heard of things where you can pre the meeting just click something and, and test yeah. the video experience but is there a thing in it because there are speed test sites all over the place yeah is it worth integrating that into that so you run a thing and it says this and this and your speed is this because the the ones yeah. when i've been done with one of our customers for a, for a couple of years supporting poor quality like you said right back then when you're out in the middle of nowhere and your connection is terrible and you ruin the meeting for everybody you don't that information isn't always obvious until, unless you go into all the metrics in the back end and you, you can usually then find out what the problem was but bringing that up a bit higher and a bit sooner in the meeting would be a useful thing but actually you know what you said about the, the green ticks type thing um is i would say eminently doable because if you think about it the team's rooms have a panel in front of it that says do you want to join do you want to share do you want to think mm. all you need is a status bar across the bottom saying video yeah. tick microphone tick yeah you know yeah. um network cable tick yeah and you know the network cable tick i guess could be a combination of is it plugged in and has it got enough um they could have it right etc and it's yeah. just a green if both of those are fine so uh, Microsoft, if you're listening to this now, <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. Thank you. Um, but uh, yeah, I think. I think but so, so, what about the the remote user? Do you? Because we've we've done a lot about this with you know our, our team of analytics stuff, etc., and about what's good quality of your voice and your video, etc. Yeah. Do we extend that out into um, end users joining on whatever device they might have been sent their teams? meetings on and you know you you, you finish the call and go actually mate that wasn't yeah. so great was it they're, they're collecting metrics because you get the pop-up in teams afterwards saying what it's like and occasionally yep. you'll get the pop-up in a team's meeting going the network connection is pretty poor they'll usually use that colloquial language which is kind of half decent but you know for sure where the network quality yeah. is but if we're looking at i'm looking at my our meeting now and there's a whole load of stuff at the top of the screen information that we can get into well there's quite a lot of spare real estate there and there could be a little live thing going mm. on because it, it it there's traffic going between my device and a central thing because this is a conference yeah which they can surely measure and yeah give real-time stat back and that could have a little red, red yeah I mean, they're, 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 they're definitely doing a lot more in the in the team's client these days like if you if you're on a poor network it will offer to do things like drop incoming video and um yeah you know suggest that you're you know you move to get better signal or or what have you but it's um the the the, the challenge as we as we said before is like it's the perception for people who are in the meeting when somebody mm. on a poor connection joins is that well teams is is bad um and it's this is this is always the thing that, that I emphasize with customers, like the reason for you know using a proper headset, making sure your connection mm. is all good is because of how you sound, how you come across to other to other people in the meeting. Like the experience might be good for you hearing other people, but if you don't sound clear to other people in the meeting, then uh, then that's a problem. Thank you, gents. Mm. That was uh, that was a pleasure. Um, mm. OK, so 
Simon, Rick, yep. thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, that was great. Uh, we will, of course, be back in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, if you enjoyed this, please do like and share. And uh, the, the, the NAS stars will be back uh, in two weeks' time for its next episode. Thank you very much, gents. Bye. Bye. Welcome to NAS Stars, the NAS Star podcast, bringing you the conversations you want to hear from the front line of tech news.